So after you do that, then if you go under assignments, then you'll see it's a, a Turnitin assignment and you can paste your document and upload it to Turnitin. So um, you just follow the directions um, and create your document and then upload it to assignments. And then it'll be graded by hand. Um, it'll take a little while to do that. But in the next couple of weeks, then um, you'll get a grade back for that. So does anybody have any questions about um, the exercise and how to do it? OK. No, I don't. If you have a question, raise your hand. Or um, like I said, I can't. Let me see. Wait, sir. OK. Um, earlier, you were going through it. Yeah. But like, the whole screen was blank. So can you, like. Oh, oh, okay. We can, we, let me try one more time. Um, it, it being blank is no good. Okay. So now can you see it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it has three parts. And like I said, you can download this from uh, course documents. You'll get exactly this word document and you'll type in your name, your last name and your first name, your super B email. And then um, you go to uh, the practice problems 10, number one, get a version you like. And then you draw by hand the supply and demand graph and fill out this information. And then you, you draw a price floor graph and fill out this information. So um, one of the things I want to point out, though, and I'm glad you asked so we could go through this together, is that, that notice they have a point distribution here. You get like one point for answering each of these questions. You actually just do it right in the document. And again, if you have any questions, Marlena, our, our student um, instructor, um, can help you because I went through all this with her. And then you paste your screenshots of your work. But then remember that you get points allocated for detail and appearance. So if your graphs that you're drawing by hand look like junk, you're gonna, you can lose, you know, there's, there's like, um, you know, 10 points for detail and appearance. So you could actually calculate all this stuff correctly and get one point a piece and then draw, draw a really yucky looking graph and, and, and lose points. So does that help? Um, I don't know who was speaking. Was it Lawrence? Yeah, sir. So. Yeah. So, okay. Is that, is that clear, Lawrence? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing this and then. Oh, see. sorry. I have another question. Okay. Go ahead. This is Mary. Okay. Hi, Mary. <clears throat> um, so when you're talking about the details, what labels are you specifically looking for? Well, that's, you know, I won't go into the oh. details um, 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 because when you guys look at the graphs in your book and from lecture, um, then you guys should see examples. And we'll talk about some of it today. I'll give you guys a really good example. Um, so, so some of it has to be a, a, a matter of judgment. But um, so, so let's go ahead and look at the basis for the assignment. Um, are you with me, Mary? Yes. Yeah. So, so here's a, a homework assignment number 10, and it's the price floor example. And you see the graph we have here, right? Mm -hmm. It's you labeled the quantity, you labeled the price. You know, you probably want to label the equilibrium price and the equilibrium quantity because it's going to have to do with some of your calculations. Um, but I'll show you something else too. Um, really quickly, let me stop share. Um, and then this is this is going to be um, the basis for our lecture today. Um, these slides. And this whole um, exercise is about um, economic efficiency. And we measure economic efficiency with this measure of uh, total surplus. And um, so I'm going to show you the, the 
main graph in this lecture. And it's this graph. Because in your guys' exercise and in the stuff that you're doing in Ignithium, you're going to probably, it asks you to label. And like, so this is a perfect graph. If your graph looks something like this, then you should get most of your points. But notice they have price and they have quantity, equilibrium, quantity, equilibrium, price. But in your guys' case, in, in the case that, that, that you all are doing, you'll have a specific price. It'll be a number and a quantity, right? And then um, you should shade in the area. It asks you to shade in the area of consumer and producer surplus using different colors like blue and pink. That's <laughs> like, um, you know, don't, don't fight the, 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 um, the example. It's not supposed to be a complicated example. So it should look something like this. Okay, Mary. All right, thanks. Sure. So, so that's the, the gist of the assignment. Um, and, uh, also the homework. Um, so if it looks something like that, that graph, then it's, you're on the right track. Um, the, the real issue is, and hopefully we can get to it today, but if not, um, then we'll talk about it soon, is um, that when it comes to a price control policy, like a price floor, and remember uh, a good example of a, a price floor would be something like the minimum wage, right? The, you can't pay less than a government legally mandated wage. And in that case, um, your graph is going to look different than the graph that I just showed you. And you have to do two cases. One is for the market equilibrium graph, and the other one is for the case of the price floor. And again, um, on, Ignith on Ignithium, on its assignment number 10, you have to go through those calculations anyway. So by the time you get finished with um, the homework quiz number 10, you, you should have a good idea of what to do, even if we don't get a chance to, to cover it in lecture today. So are there any other really quick questions for me? Is everybody on board? Wait, sir, so when is, the, um, when is this homework due? When's the graphing? Yeah, so so again, it's posted on Blackboard, but it's it's on Wednesday, October the seventh. So we oh yeah, it's next week. Yeah, next week. Okay. So um, remember, and I'll kind of go through this stuff um, quickly to kind of get to the the main point. But whenever we're we're talking about um, market, the, the main point that um, economists like to make, and remember that whenever you're talking about, and actually maybe I'll, I'll, I'll talk to somebody specific here, um, and maybe this will help. So Ezekiel, you, you have your, your mic? Oh, yes, I do. Okay. So one of the things to think about, and this is one of the big points in economics, is economists will say, well, you can allocate resources in a lot of different ways. And a lot of times it involves government intervention in things like health care and um, maybe rent control for people who can't afford their rent and stuff like that. But when you're doing that, you're not using the market. Is that clear, Ezekiel? Yeah. The market is just people who are free to trade with one another, negotiate their own deals, do their own thing. And we model this market outcome. And there's been a long, long, long debate, and it's probably hard for you guys to understand this unless um, you were kind of a good student in history. Um, do you remember there was a thing called the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 in Russia? Yeah. That's when they, they created the Soviet Union. Well, in the early 1900s leading up to 1917, um, there is an alternative to using markets to allocate resources. And that's what economists call centralized planning. But what you might 
be more familiar with is the term communism. Have you heard of communism, Ezekiel? Yeah, I've heard of communism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, do you know what, what the, the idea of communism is about? Yeah. Well, the, the government, they um, control the, the means of production, but I like to understand it more as in uh, that they control where the, where the, they kind of, um, they have, well, when it, versus, I like to remember like this, versus uh, um, the, the free market is that uh, we make the decisions on to, how, what to trade and what to buy. Yeah, and what to make. Have, yeah, but when we can't make the decisions, the government has to make everyone's individual decisions. So it, ha it takes a big, uh, big amount of um, like actual resources, like people to actually allocate. So you see like huge buildings that are just dedicated to, you know, reallocating the resources. Yeah. Well, there's lots of things, but, but really the way that economists think about it is like they use this term centralized planning to describe what it's normally the government coming up with this huge like production plan and um, deciding everything to produce. So no private companies. And the other feature that economists point to is ownership of resources. And so um, a purely market-based economy, which we don't have here in the United States, um, is where all of the resources are owned by private individuals. And in a purely communist setting, and there are no really good examples now that the Soviet Union is gone, except for maybe North Korea, and I don't know how they do things exactly in Cuba, but they're another one that people typically give as examples. But in a, in a pure communist setting, there's only public ownership of resources. So no, people don't own their own cars. They don't own their own houses. They might be given those things to use for, by the government with permission, but like think of an electrician that has a private business here and has a truck they use for their business and the tools no longer do under a, a communist system do they own the truck or do they own the tools those aren't their tools those are tools that belong to you know the government electrical bureau and and um they can't decide to sell them or trade them or get rid of them or or whatever they just yeah they're they're given to them to use for so long as the government's willing to let them use them. And, and, and so there's a, a central planning and public ownership. That's the communist way of allocating resources. Remember allocating resources is like who gets the trucks, who gets to use them, what businesses are going to produce what stuff. All of those decisions are made by the government in a purely communist um society. And again, I'd like to point out that in the United States, a lot of people don't think of this, um, but about a third, that's one third of all of our resources are owned publicly by the government. So we're not a purely free market system, but about two thirds of our resources are owned by private individuals, whether they be through corporate entities like Jeff Bezos and Amazon and the shareholders in Amazon. Like I have shares in Amazon, so I'm a part owner of Amazon. So every time you want to see one of those Amazon trucks, I own a tiny little piece of it, maybe like one screw. And, and everybody else that invests in Amazon. And a lot of times people think, oh, well, um, that's only for rich people. They're not going to ever own any Amazon or Google stock, but it's not true because the reason why I own Amazon and Google stock is not as a, an investor that invested individually to buy that stuff, but I have a pension fund as a state employee and the largest private investor in the whole United States is the California public employees retirement system. So they take my retirement money and they invest it on my behalf and um, and then I become a part owner in all the companies they invest in and then that helps pay my retirement. So most of you, before you actually 
retire 50 years from now or something, um, you're going to own Amazon and you're going to own Google and you're going to be happy that those companies, companies are profitable because if they're profitable, it's going to mean you have more money in your retirement account at the end and have a better um, retirement. So, so in the United States, about two thirds, which is most, right? It's like almost 70% of all the resources are owned by private individuals. But the government, a lot of people are like, well, what does the government own? Well, obviously, right? Like the police and firefighting vehicles, those buildings, the libraries, the CSU campuses, those are all resources that are owned by the government. And the state of California decides how many to buy and who gets to use them and what they're used for. Uh, but what you guys probably don't think about is like all of the national forests, right? So there's all of this land um, that's owned and controlled by the government publicly. And the only way to influence, for example, I think one of the stupidest things, honestly, is um, the Angeles National Forest. I don't know if you guys have been, I go hiking up there. I like to go hiking up there, but the Angeles National Forest is right next to Los Angeles. So if you go into like the, the foothills of Pasadena and La Cunada, there are these um, state and national parks there. Um, and you can go do a day hike. You can drive an hour, just a little bit north of Pasadena and go hiking up there. It's cool stuff, but right. I would argue that that's a really bad decision to have all of those national parks so close to Los Angeles because the land there could be used for housing. And if it was used for housing, because all these people live in Los Angeles, there'd be a big increase in the supply of housing and a big decrease in the cost of housing. And all of these, these issues with you know affordable housing would go away um, if we expanded the supply or at least be lessened. Um, but, you know, the government's decided, listen, Angeles National Forest is here. And you, you could argue, I'm not saying it's not a bad, it's a bad argument. And a, a lot of people would argue, hey, well, we want to have Angeles National Forest so we can go on day hikes. And we want to have national, um, the National Forest right there because we want to preserve the habitat for the coyotes and for the um, the mountain lions. And I'm not saying those aren't good goals, but I would also argue that there's lots of other land out there that's much further away from Los Angeles where the coyotes and the mountain lions can play and it's gonna be cheap for them because that's cheap land, not near a big metropolitan area like Los Angeles where we have all these housing issues. So anyway, I digress. But the main point is if you compare like China, for example, China is almost exactly the opposite of us. They have about two thirds of their resources controlled by the government and about 20% in the hands of private individuals. So they're not fully communist either in the economic sense, they still have people go and buy furniture and clothes and stuff like that. So, so different societies do it different ways. And the, the main argument back in the early 1900s, if you think about it, and I'll ask you Ezekiel, okay, since I got you up here, I would say, and I'm gonna say the central planners argument, okay? This is the argument for communism. This is the argument that was made, okay? If you have the government controlling the resources, then the government is going to use the best scientists, the best production engineers, the smartest people in society to figure out the best way to provide for the needs of society. If you let private individuals do it, then you're gonna have, like my, one of my grandfathers um, owned a catering truck, basically a food truck. And that was what he did. He would get up at two o'clock in the morning. He would cook all the stuff. And he actually had a, a cook that he hired that would help him. He owned that truck. He went out. That was his business. And, and um, the, the, the communists or the people in favor of central planning would say, 
you know what? Your grandfather, and this is true, my grandfather had a third grade education. He grew up during the Great Depression and he quit going to school in third grade because he had to go out to hunt to get food for his family. So they would say, listen, your grandfather is going to make all of these mistakes with that truck. He's going to put the wrong food on it. He's not been educated in how to maintain it. How the heck can he possibly figure out what's the best thing to do with that truck? And I don't know if you guys know, but food trucks are a big investment. You have a nice one. Like he had a nice one. You know, you're talking a couple hundred thousand dollars in terms of pieces, a piece of equipment. So, and he's feeding lots of people. So, so the communists would say, listen, your grandpa might be a great guy. He might be a great worker, but we'll figure out what to do with that truck so that it can feed the most people and be run in the most efficient way. We'll pick the streets it's going to go down on. He's not going to do that because we're going to have the best and brightest minds um, managing the resources. And honestly, I think that's a pretty seductive argument. It's a pretty good argument that, listen, you don't want private people deciding what to do with land and, and with all of these scarce resources because they're just going to end up screwing things up because, you know, how can they compete with the people in our case, the engineers at Stanford and MIT and – and Harvard and Yale and all of the best and the brightest minds in, in terms of figuring out what to do with the resources. So what do you think of that argument, Ezekiel? Well, you you persuaded? Think, yeah, I say it was, uh, I, you did make it seem really, really strong. Like, uh, oh yeah, it was persuasive. Yeah, yeah I think it's a, it's, a, it's a really good argument. And this is the argument that they made at the turn of the 20th century that led to the Bolshevik revolution is they're like, no, 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 no. We don't want to have a bunch of private people just deciding, like, think about it, for example. I don't know what percentage of Amazon that Jeff Bezos owns, but he obviously owns a lot of it. He started the company. Suppose that, that Bezos, and I'm not saying Bezos isn't a smart guy, but suppose Bezos just decides like, uh, you know, I'm going to switch all of the Amazon trucks to electric, right? And he doesn't know how much electrical infrastructure is out there. And Amazon just grinds to a halt because this one person and, – and, and why can Bezos do that? Because he owns it, right? And so even if he screws everything up that everybody else is depending on, like he has the power to do that. And, and um, you know, the, the central planners, the – communist people they were worried that that private individuals would make these like knee-jerk reaction decisions and do stuff they would actually cause a lot of damage they wouldn't grow enough food for society they wouldn't produce the right goods and stuff like that now it's such a good argument that the people who were in favor of free markets spent a lot of time trying to think about it. And what they came up with is what we're studying right now. And the only argument for the free market advocates was this. And it's actually two pieces. And we're just studying one piece. But, but um, the, the big piece of it was, well, unlike the government, the free market is going to end up being what they call efficient in the end. And the reason it's going to be efficient is because like my grandfather, he has to compete with other private food truck operators. And if he doesn't produce a good product at a good price, then his business will fail and he'll go bankrupt. Somebody else will buy his food truck. They'll take his route. So e that sort of discipline of competition, what they call the discipline of the market, is that if you don't do a good job of managing the resources that you have in a business, then your business fails. And businesses fail all the time. I could show you guys some statistics, but I'm, I don't think there's anybody that doubts me that businesses are going bankrupt 
all the time and uh, being taken over by other companies and and you know they fail but if the government screws up right if somebody isn't paying attention and everybody knows at the end of the day that real people have to do these things even the brilliant people at MIT and Stanford and Harvard have bad days and get overwhelmed and make mistakes. They might do better than us most of the time, but they do screw up. Um, and so if the government is managing, let's say a food truck and that food truck doesn't have good food on it and the food's not the right price and um, people don't really get a lot out of value out of that government provided food truck, then guess what? The government just keeps going because who's going to tell them to stop, right? It's, it's not like they can go bankrupt and be taken over by definition. They're at the top. They're the government, right? So, you know, if the DMV doesn't do a good job, we can all complain, but it's not like the DMV can be taken over by some other private provider of driver's licenses or something like that. So, so, so the main argument is that the private market is efficient because it has to be, because all of the private businesses will go bankrupt if they don't do a good job of managing the resources. That's the big argument. And then the other argument that we don't really talk too much about and Tell me if you think this is persuasive, Ezekiel, okay? So, so is that people like my grandfather with a third grade education, he might not know everything that, you know, a food specialist at MIT or transportation engineer at UCLA knows, but the one thing he does know, probably better than them, is how to operate a food truck because he does it day in, day out, every day, like he did for like 30 years. So every time something changes, people decide they wanna have like Korean tacos instead of uh, you know some sort of a torta or something like that. He, he sees his customers every day and that type of information can get to him more quickly because he's going to say, oh, well, I put out these types of burritos. Um, I remember he used to he used to come home and he'd give us basically like the leftovers from the day that he didn't sell. And so we would end up eating. I don't know if anybody's ever had like a lengua burrito. So that's like that's like tongue. And it's like a really chewy meat. So like people don't want it want that. So grandpa feed it to us. But guess what? He wouldn't make any more lengua burritos. He'd stick with the carne asada, and that, you know, because he could tell, right? And so, if the government decides, you know, lengua burritos are on the menu and people don't really like it, then again, if my grandpa didn't adapt, he would fail, and he got to see everything up close. So the guys at Stanford and Harvard and MIT, they may be brilliant in their own capacity, but it's hard for them to have access to that day-to-day -day information that can guide the decisions of a business owner. So the basic argument is that, that uh, and we use the term efficiency. Um, the, the big idea here is it gets covered up all the details that I mentioned with a simple phrase, and that is that competitive markets are efficient. And, and what they mean by that is that they'll be driven to produce the goods at the lowest cost and the goods will go to the people who value them the most. Um, and that's all going to be happening through this decentralized competition because if a business owner doesn't produce at a lower cost, then someone else will come in underneath him and take his business and he'll fail or she'll fail. And if the business owner doesn't seek out the customers that they want to market to that, are going to pay the most for their their um, their product, then again, uh, somebody else will take those customers. So that constant competition uh, disciplines and guides resources in a decentralized competitive market. So so now, what do you think, Ezekiel? Are you convinced? 
Yeah, I'm convinced now on the other side, but uh, I, 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 I see the art, but that's the reason why we're, we're not purely either, either, either market. We're yeah. Either. A little bit of both. Right. Cause there are some cases where the first argument seems to work better. Now I would argue that, that, um, there are only a few cases where the centralized planning argument works well. I wouldn't deny that, that, it ne that it never works well, but I think honestly, like I was making the argument before about, um, you know, the Nash, the Angeles national forest being managed poorly by the government. Um, th those things still happen. It's just that, at this time the decision was made um it didn't seem like such a bad decision but it takes a long time for the government to be convinced that their decisions are bad so anyway so so that's the meaning um um competitive markets are efficient so how do we measure that well again we use this this tool called welfare economics now welfare you might think of as being like um, food stamps or somebody helping somebody out with government aid, but that's not what we mean by welfare here. We just mean simply the well-being of society overall. We're not talking about any specific government policies. We're just talking about a w way of measuring um, um, what happens with the allocation of resources in a society and how we can measure it. We're gonna try to measure the benefits that buyers and sellers receive from participating in a competitive market. And so we're gonna start by looking at the equilibrium of a competitive market, which you all should be familiar with at this point in time. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that, but we are gonna say that the equilibrium is gonna maximize those benefits. And that's what we mean by efficiency. Um, so if you wanna write it down in your notes or someplace, I'll say it one more time that the competitive market being efficient means that it maximizes, makes as big as possible, the benefits um, that producers and consumers get from the resource allocation. So maximizing total welfare for both consumers and producers. So, and that's you know probably one little piece of the trick here is that when we do our analysis, we cleanly divide society into a group of buyers and a group of sellers. And we realize that both groups are part of society and important to society. And so we measure the benefits to both the buyers and the sellers. For the buyers or the consumers, we're gonna measure their um, benefits with this thing called consumer surplus. So it says consumer surplus measures economic welfare or benefits to buyers. And then we use this concept of producer surplus to measure the economic benefits to sellers. Now, I wanna tell you really quickly that producer surplus is um, like profit. I say it's like profit because it's not exactly profit, but um, every time, and these are gonna be dollar measures, every time a producer earns one more dollar of profit, their producer surplus goes up by a dollar. So they're very, very closely related concepts. So you can think of producer surplus as being like profits. And for consumer surplus, it's gonna be a dollar measure of the benefits to consumers from operating in a market, but we're gonna to have to, to talk about how we measure it a little bit more. So for consumer surplus, we start out with this concept of willingness to pay. Willingness to pay is the maximum amount that a buyer would pay for a good. Um, and so for example, you can imagine there are lots of things in, that influence the willingness to pay of a buyer. One of them being their income. It, rich buyers tend to be willing to pay more for things than poor buyers do. But it's not always just income, right? Sometimes the other important factor is the consumer's preferences. Like what do they really want? So um, I was talking to a student about an hour ago in another class and I, I asked what his favorite car was, and he said it was an Audi R8. I don't know, have you guys seen the Audi R8? Yeah, anyway, and then I said, well, so how much is it? And he looked it up on Google really quickly, $170,000, right? 
Well, he doesn't own an R8 because he can't afford one right now. <laughs> but but that's like the car that he wants. And, and you know, some, at some point in time, he may actually go out and get an R8 a couple years. He graduates and he's got a good job and maybe he's – but why, right? It's not just his income. It's also his preferences. And lots of things can influence preferences. A lot of times people pay a lot of money for really high-quality medical care when they have some desperate illness. And it's not that they're rich. It's just that they're willing to pay a lot because they need help. And so a lot of things influence willingness to pay. Um, but it, again, it's a measure of how much a buyer values a good or a service. And it's a dollar measure, which is nice for us because in economics, it means we can actually calculate um, how much willingness to pay is. So consumer surplus is the buyer's willingness to pay minus the amount the buyer actually pays. So if you've ever gotten a really good deal on something, then you know what consumer surplus is. I can, I can um, think of a couple of times where normally um, I, I wouldn't buy something and then something happened. So um, when I was traveling um, this weekend uh, up to Sacramento on, on the way back, I stopped at a little gas station with my daughter and it, it, it was in the middle of nowhere, you know, be somewhere between Bakersfield and Sacramento. And um, I noticed that they had this one shelf in, in the gas station that was for automobile repair and including a gas can. <laughs> so, so, but the gas can was really expensive, right? But you can imagine if you were somebody who was trapped and you didn't have enough gas and you'd walked like five miles to get gas for your car, that gas can, it was a plastic gas can. It's like 20 bucks. Probably you could get it for $5 at Home Depot down here. But um, you probably be willing to pay 40 or 50 bucks for that gas can because you could get your car <laughs> unstuck from, you know, running out of gas in the middle of the road. So, so yeah, if if I had walked in there and my car was stuck down the road, I'd be really happy to pay twenty dollars for a gas can because my willingness to pay would have been like fifty. So I still got a deal, and that difference between what I was willing to pay and what I had to pay, um, especially if I didn't have something like AAA, right? If I had to call a tow truck and pay a couple hundred dollars versus walk in there and buy a gas can and then go refill my gas myself. I could save, right? So my willingness to pay might be even a hundred or hundred and fifty dollars for the gas can, because the alternative is to call a tow truck. And I only have to pay twenty dollars for it, fill it up with gas, and I can I can solve my problem. So so consumer surplus is that savings you get by not having to pay the maximum when you buy things. And a lot of us don't ever think about what our true willingness to pay is, unless you're in one of those situations where you're, you're thinking about getting something and then you're like, well, it's kind of expensive. And then you think maybe, maybe not. Then you know that the price is close to your maximum willingness to pay. But most of the time um, you walk in and you buy something and you just, you know, you know, you would have been willing to pay more for it, but you don't have to. And that's consumer surplus that people get every day from interacting in the market. So here's a good example of four buyers, John, Paul, George, and Ringo, the Beatles, right? And John's willing to pay $100. Paul's willing to pay $80. George is willing to pay $70. Ringo's willing to pay $50. Maybe it's for a beat up old guitar or something. Um, and, um, we're going to follow up in a minute with those four consumers, but we can do a simple, um, sort of demand curve for these individuals. So uh, again, we're saying they would buy a beat up 
guitar maybe. Um, and no one would be willing to buy a guitar at more than $100 because that was um, John's maximum, his willingness to pay. So at more than $100, nobody would buy a guitar. Between 80 and 100, it would be only John. Between 80 and 70, now we've gotten down to um, the area below uh, Paul's willingness to pay. And then you could sell two beat up guitars, one to Paul and one to John. Between 50 and 70, there would be three of them. And at less than 50, they'd all buy a guitar. So we can plot this on our um, demand and supply. Well, this is price of album. I was using guitar, um, but it could be an album instead. That's fine. But it looked like this stair step shape. This is different than the demand curves we normally look at, but that's only because we're assuming that the people have to purchase whole units. In our examples, we always have these smooth curves because we're assuming that we're talking about something like, you know, sugar, flour, gasoline that you can buy in infinitely divisible quantities. But this is a, you know, a simple example where you have to buy in, in whole units. And so there's the demand curve. Now let's look at the price of 80. This is the consumer surplus that goes, um, just to John, if the price was 80, he'd be the only person in the market and his willingness to pay is 100. Notice that the area of the shaded area here, it's got, it's a little rectangle. The height of it's between 180. It's got a height of 20 and it's got a width of from zero to one, one unit. So 20 times one is the area of this. We can actually measure John's consumer surplus. And it is, you know, according to the intuition, he's willing to pay 100. He only has to pay 80. And so he gets $20 worth of consumer surplus if the price is 80. And then again, if we looked at lowering the price to 70, then that would mean that John would get an extra, right, $10 worth of consumer surplus. You can see his little area of consumer surplus gets bigger. And, um, now we add a new customer, which is Paul, and you can see his dark blue area there is um, his consumer surplus. So you can add them and get the total amount of consumer surplus between the two consumers. It's gonna be this, these joined rectangular areas there. So, and we could continue on, um, but this is an example that's more familiar. At whatever price, consumer surplus, is gonna be the area below the demand curve, above the price that consumers pay, and to the left of the quantity. It's normally gonna look like a triangle because we have these smooth straight line demand curves in our examples. But this is what consumer surplus looks like. And if we had the specific prices um, so that we, we knew the distances here, we could measure um, consumer surplus. It would be the area of a, this triangle. And it would come out to be an amount of dollars um, that the consumers basically were saving as a result of purchasing through this market at the price P1. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about that? No? Okay. Is it clear, easy, cool? Okay, good. Yeah. Oh, okay. So at another price, a lower price, right? This was our initial consumer surplus. Again, we would add some additional consumer surplus to those original consumers that were purchasing the original quantity Q1. And then we would add in some new consumers and they'd get some consumer surplus too. Because as we lower the price, we're gonna move down the demand curve from C to F. So um, we could measure the consumer surplus and how much it changes um, by, by comparing um, these areas. So, so what exactly does consumer surplus measure? Well, again, it's kind of, a lot of people call it psychic income because if you were willing to pay a lot and you only had to pay a little, there were no dollars that actually went into your pocket, but in your mind, you know, like, oh gosh, I got a great deal. And you're happy about that because that really freed up some income you could spend on other things. So. I'll give you guys one more example, and this is 
a personal example for me. My personal example is that um, I need a new air conditioner. <laughs> so, so the air conditioner that I have is, uh, you know, central air conditioner. It's probably 40 years old. And it's been working well up until like last year. And then um, it started to have some problems. And I was hoping, and I'm still hoping because it's still working, to get through this summer. Um, but I don't know if you guys know, um, but the next couple of days are supposed to be 100 plus. I was hoping by the end of October we would be over this. So wish me luck. Um, but if I want to get a new air conditioner for my home, if you just, you know, Google the people that do the air conditioning, plumbing and heating stuff, a new air conditioner is going to run about 10 grand and um, for my home. And you could spend more, but 10 grand is like a fair estimate. It turns out though, that luckily my wife um, has a friend that is an air conditioning person and installs those things. In fact, his main job is that he works for a local school district and he manages and replaces all of the air conditioners in all the schools in their school district. So he does it all the time. He's skilled at it, he's trained, but he will sometimes on his weekends um, to make a little bit of extra money, put in an air conditioner for people that he knows and um, gets referrals to. And so he's gonna charge me only about $6,000. So I still haven't done it because I don't want to part with six grand before I have to, but I'm really happy that I'm going to save basically $4,000 because um, my wife has this buddy that um, will uh, put the air conditioner in for much less than I'd have to pay just a, a company out there. Now, obviously he can do that because he doesn't have all the expenses that those companies have maintaining their warehouses and all of you know their employees and the rest of it because he's just doing it on his own but that's a little bit beside the point why he charges less but for me it's like somebody wrote me a check for four thousand dollars because i don't have to spend ten i only have to spend six and if you ask me am i willing to to pay ten thousand dollars for a new air conditioner well as soon as this one actually dies <laughs> I'm willing because I'm not going to sit around in my house, especially on Zoom calls. I can't even escape to the office and and deal with 105 degree heat. Um, the dogs would probably die. I don't know. Um, you know, I got I got my dogs, so and my kids would complain like crazy. So, so yeah. I mean, I'm stuck. I got to pay basically what it costs to get a new air conditioner, given that I live in Southern California. Um, so, and I don't live close enough to the beach. It's going to be, it's going to be 105. So, so yeah, but that's consumer surplus. Consumer surplus is, is that savings I get from um, having that market opportunity with that, that allows me to pay less than my absolute maximum for the stuff that I buy. So producer surplus, again, is really similar, but the way we calculate producer surplus is producer surplus is the amount that the producer is paid minus their cost. So I can go back to the example of, of the, the buddy that's gonna put in the air conditioner because we were talking a little bit about you know his costs. Basically, I know he's going to at um, go to an air conditioning supplier once I decide what air conditioner I want. He's going to buy it um, from them, and then he's probably going to spend $4,000, and then he's going to come out here and do the work for me, and he's going to take home $2,000. So he wouldn't, even though um, you know we're friendly acquaintances, he's not going to charge me $2,000 for a new air conditioner because it's going to cost him $4,000 just for the unit. So he's not going to um, um, sell it for anything less than his cost. But 
when he sells it for more than his cost, then he does make a profit, and and um, that's what we're calling producer surplus. Now, again, I remind remind you, there's some technicalities we'll get into about calculating profits in uh, another week or two. So it's not exactly profit, but it's very similar. It's the amount of money that the sellers paid minus their cost. So it's what they're making above their cost that is their producer surplus. And so now here we have another example of four individual sellers with different costs. And again, it's like the air conditioning people, the people that are selling it for 10 grand, they've got their websites and their staff and their salespeople and all these other additional costs. So there are some higher cost producers, some lower cost producers. Um, and we can um, plot those um, supply curves. And there, since these are individual units, again, um, it's going to look kind of like a stair step shape. And then once we throw in um, the price that they're going to sell the good for, notice here's the lowest cost producer we said at a cost of $500. If they sell the good for $600, then um, in this case, it's grandma. She's going to um, end up with, you know, she sells it for six, but it only costs her five. That's going to be $100 worth of producer surplus. And again, notice it's an area the this rectangle has a height of 100 and a width of one length times width is 100 times one which is 100 dollars worth of producer surplus and then again we can measure additions to producer surplus if the price goes up it brings in another supplier into the market and that's the dark pink and then adds to the amount of producer surplus that the low cost producer gets so um, are there any questions about that? I think this is pretty straightforward since we went through the other one. Um, I see here's the chat. Um, but um, OK. All right. So everybody asked a few questions. Yeah. So if, if you guys see something in, in chat, and I don't see it because I can't keep everything up on my screen at once, somebody can just like shout out and say, oh, people are asking questions in the chat. But yeah, I plan on posting this like I did with the, you know, I think almost all the other lectures. Um, so you guys can refer to it. Um, so yeah, producer surplus is the, the area. So Here's again another example. Notice it looks like a triangle. It's the area above the supply curve, below the price the seller receives, and to the left of the quantity that they sell. And so we can measure the area of this triangle. And again, it's going to be an amount of dollars um, that comes out. That's going to be the unit. The, the area is just a number, but then we put a dollar sign in front of it so we can. Um... By the way, I want to tell you, in case you haven't figured this out, if you've done the practice, you probably have. But Ignithium just expects numbers, no units. Um, there, there, there was a, the units are implicit. Um, but there was a student who I talked to last week that was typing in uh, a unit, like, you know, $100. And it's not looking for that. It just wants a number. So anyway, um, and again, we can use these triangles and as they change, as we raise the price to measure the changes in producer surplus and um, um, hopefully that's, that's clear. Okay, so market efficiency. If you add consumer and producer surplus together, you get this measure of total surplus. And we ask this question, is the, the allocation of resources determined by a free market desirable in any way? And so, again, this is the consumer surplus plus the producer surplus. Um, and then we get this measure of um, what we call total surplus, which if you're careful about looking at the calculations in these slides, notice it starts with value to buyers, subtract off the amount paid to buyers, right, and then the amount receive to sellers. Well, if the buyers pay it, the sellers re receive it. This is a negative up here and a positive down there. So they cancel out each other when you add them together. And it ends up just being these last 
terms, the first one value to buyers minus cost to sellers is the total surplus. So you can add consumer and surplus, consumer surplus and producer surplus together, or you can just take the value to buyers minus the, minus the cost to sellers and that's total surplus. So efficiency is that total surplus is maximized. That's what we mean by efficiency. So in a lot of ways, one quick analogy I'll give you that will hopefully help is that if I talk about a car as being fuel efficient, right? The most efficient car is the one that gets the most miles per gallon, right? Higher miles per gallon means more efficient. In economic terms, if we talk about benefits from transactions, the most efficient market is the one that gives the most benefits. Our measure of benefits is total surplus. So the most total surplus is the most efficient. And, and our argument basically boils down to that competitive markets will generate the most um, possible surplus um, for allocating a good. And I'll leave it there for today because we've run out of time. Do you guys have any quick questions for me? Anybody? Anybody in the chat or anything? I'll pull up the chat one more time. Okay. Questions. Okay. All right. So I'll be talking to you all soon. Okay. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.